Hello, church family, and thank you once again for joining us for our online Sunday School. It's been a blessing to be able to meet with you every week online through this video, and even to meet with some of you on Sunday through Zoom. We're excited to be able to move on this online platform, but you know what I'm even more excited about? Being able to see each and every one of you in a couple of weeks. Um, hopefully more consistently, and maybe even sooner than that, to be honest, with all the things that are going on around our world, we're excited to be able to see the church reopen its doors, even if it may be in some limited fashion, even if it's going to be socially distanced, even if we're going to be doing a lot extra things to be able to keep our church facility clean. I hope you've already read all the different guidelines that Pastor has put out online, and I hope that you're ready to be able to meet here at church. But for now, we're going to have these online Sunday schools and we're gonna to continue to post it indefinitely and just so that way you're able to have more material online to be able to help you through these, in, in a very true sense, in these difficult times. And I hope right now, as you are watching this video, we're gonna start with our next lesson the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Go ahead and get your Bibles out, go ahead and get your notes, and we're gonna start very soon. Thank you. Hello, church family. Today's lesson is entitled, The Spirit of Truth and the Spirit of Error. We're gonna jump right into this message, or right into the Sunday School lesson, and turn in our Bibles to 1 John 4, verses one through six. You can follow along as I read this aloud, 1 John 4, verses one through six. It says here, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already, is it in the world? Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's go ahead and start in a word of prayer. Lord Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be able to have our Sunday school hour, even if it is online, Lord. I pray that we would be able to grow from this time and be able to really understand the truth and understand the words that are being said here in the scriptures and be able to really use it for our own lives. Help us to be careful for that antichrist. Help us to be careful for the devil. Help us to find and cling to the spirit of truth, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're diagnosed with a disease, you know what the truth is? You're not gonna want your doctor to spare your feelings. You're not gonna want for your doctor to lie to you. You want your doctor to tell you the truth. Why? So that you can get your illness fixed. If your doctor said to you, take two aspirins and call me in the morning, that may work for a headache, that may work for you know, any type of pain or something like that, but it doesn't work if you have a disease that can't be solved by aspirin. If you have a major heart disease, if you have cancer, the truth hurts, right? But just like a disease, you have to hear about your problem in order to address it. Nothing in the world is more valuable than truth. Now I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I desire 
to know the truth. We read in 1 John verses 4, 1 through 6, and I want you to notice specifically verse 6. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. A war is raging on this earth, and it's not a physical war. It is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual war between the prince of this world, who is the spirit of error, and the Lord our God, who is the spirit of truth. John sounds out a warning. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. When someone is speaking in the name of God, that does not mean necessarily immediately that he is speaking truth. We should not blindly believe that everything that he is saying is true. God declares that we are to try the spirits. Many false prophets are, are going out in the world. They're preaching, they're teaching, they're making out all these different things. And do you know what's the truth? These are false prophets. And these false prophets are not the spokespersons for God. They are a spokesperson for the devil. God tells us of the spirit of the Antichrist. Antichrist means anything that is instead of Christ, or, to put it bluntly, anything that is against Christ. When John penned his words in the epistle that we're reading right now, 1 John, in the first century, the spirit of the Antichrist already existed. It was already present in this world. And that is what gives us to the first point, the first truth, right? This first reality, the invasion by the spirit of error. Remember, the lesson for today is the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There is a reality that the devil is trying to invade. He's trying to attack. He's trying to make the church weaker. He's trying to invade. We have been invaded by Satan. He and his forces now seek to control the world. When we look out into the world, you may even say that it seems like the devil has a lot of control. He has brought to our world the spirit of error. Let's think about the first invasion of the devil in relation to truth, in relation to this spiritual battle. Where was that? Oh yes, in the garden. The devil invaded the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, they didn't yield to the spirit of truth. Instead, they yielded to the spirit of error. They yielded to the lie of the devil. They rebelled against God, refusing to have his authority over their lives. The spirit of error entered into the world and into the bloodstream of our first parents. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, became sinners by nature. Now, we are inheritors of that sinful nature. So what does that mean? We are bent toward following the sinful nature and following the spirit of error. Uh, one of the things that I um, have become interested in is in, I guess what you would call kind of like, the interesting part of tricking, right? The art of trickery, the art of deception. Uh, duck hunters are an example of this kind of trickery, right? Duck hunters use what are called decoys. Today, these decoys have gotten pretty fancy, right? The decoys will actually quack like a duck, it will move like a duck, it will look like a duck, and in some cases, it will even act like a duck. In fact, the ducks think that these decoys are ducks. And the real ducks, well, they end up being dead ducks because they can't tell what's real. For the Christian, there are many roving decoys out there. You know what their job is? Their job is to extricate us from the intimate experience of our faith. 
Remember, by nature, you're inclined to the spirit of error. But after you're saved, you should be inclined towards the spirit of truth. So what does Satan do instead? Instead of just in, in trying to entice us with the spirit of error, which he already does, he attempts now to coat and hide the spirit of error in the appearance of the spirit of truth. We have to look beyond what a person says or how they perform to determine their authenticity. What do we have to do instead? We have to evaluate and test the spirits. We must be on guard for the decoys. Those decoys, they're moving all around us, acting like the real thing. But you know what their purpose is? They really just want to deceive you. They really just want to trick you. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. We must be aware that this spirit of error has become a part of the fabric of our society. As it says in Hosea, verses four, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, there is no truth in our land. It is the truth of God's word that sets us free. That's John 8, 32. And what does that truth do? It reveals error. So even though there is an invasion of the spirit of error, and that has gone all the way from the beginning of the world, there is more importantly for you as a believer, more importantly, there is the indwelling of the spirit of truth. The Lord Jesus indwells every believer in the person of the Holy Spirit. Notice what the Bible says in 1 John 4, verses 1 through 4, the expression, the spirit of truth. What does, that, what does that actually tell us? It is directly referring to the Holy Spirit. When I say that the spirit of truth indwells you, I mean the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. Isn't that a comforting thought? What does the Bible say? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God has made us conquerors. He's made us conquerors in the Lord Jesus. Remember that Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, truth is not a philosophical system. Truth is in the person of Jesus Christ. If a person rejects the Christ of the Bible, no matter how intelligent he may claim to be, he will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. That's what 2 Timothy 3.7 says. 2 Peter 2.21 says, For it had been better of them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. The most important thing for you as a believer is that you stick and stay with your belief, that you enlighten yourself to truth. I was reading a story about this person, uh, Kitty Dukakis, and uh, Dukakis was interviewed on 2020 and made public her addictions. Uh, <coughs> not only was she taking pills and drinking alcohol, but she was addicted to it, right? She was drinking rubbing alcohol and nail remover. Uh, to her, it was anything that had just a little bit of alcohol. During the interview, she admitted that she didn't begin to come to grips with her problem until she finally faced the truth. What was her truth? That she was an inde uh, indeed an addict. As long as she could give excuses, as long as she could blame it on something else, as long as she could blame it on the campaign, as long as she could blame it on the pressure, as long as she could blame it on something else and did not deal with the truth, she was killing herself. When Ms. Dukakis came to understand the truth, then she was able to get something done. Some of us won't get better until somebody gets to us and has the guts to tell us what the truth is. But speaking the truth in love 
may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. James 5, 19 through 20 says this, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Unlike uh, Dukakis, or one of the things that we have to realize is that we have the Holy Spirit, the truth, inside us. And we have to let that truth, the spirit of truth, speaks to us, speak to us. We have to confront ourselves with the truth. We have to allow God to move in us. So we see that there is an invasion of the spirit of error and there is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Lastly, there is the identification that God requires. The identification God requires is really simple. Why is it simple? In 1 John 4, 2, it says, Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Here's the reality. Truth is of God. The writer declares that if they confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is God. If they declare that, right? If they declare that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, then they are of God. This is referring to the incarnation of Christ, his virgin birth. Notice the word come in this verse. The Lord Jesus Christ did not begin in Bethlehem. He had no beginning. He had no ending. He came to earth. He came to this earth and became a man without ceasing to be God. He was robed in the flesh. He had a real body in which to go to and end up going to the cross to bleed and die for our sins. At this time, John was dealing with the Gnostics in his day. Those who believed in philosophy, in this philosophy that Jesus Christ only seemed to be a man. The Lord Jesus was just as much a man as if he had never been man. He was the God-man. He was the God-man who became man without ceasing to be God. As we try the spirits, we must listen for an open confession of Jesus Christ. There were many Jesus in the day in which our Lord lived, but there was only one Jesus Christ. If there is an unwillingness to make an open confession of Jesus Christ, to come in the flesh, you know what that proves? That proves that that person is actually an antichrist. Either he is replacing Jesus or he's actually against Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 1 through 4 says, Would to God that ye could come with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means... As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4 says, For if he that preacheth another Jesus, whom ye have not preached, or whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. There's a problem in us not being able to come to grips with this truth, right? We ha or with other people coming to grips with this truth that Jesus Christ is God. You must admit that Jesus Christ is God. The test is whether we are going to be true followers of Jesus Christ and love the Lord Jesus more than the approval of the world. 
It's going to be tough for people to understand even that you believe that Jesus Christ is God. We must declare with holy boldness the true message of Jesus Christ, God's Son. As we declare this message, we must be aware that we live in a world that is absolutely saturated with the spirit of error. So much of what we hear, I'll be honest, sounds very spiritual and good. When we talk about the spirit of error, it's infiltrated the churches in many ways. But we, instead, must stay with the truth of God's word. Be guided by the spirit of truth. And here's the important part. Put everything to the test. What's the test, you may ask? Jesus Christ is the test. If what one says does not line up with what the scripture says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, the Christ of the Bible, then we have to stand strong and firm on what God says concerning his only begotten son. And that's the truth. That we have to realize that there is this war. There is this battle. And as I close today, I want to challenge you. Fight for Jesus. Fight against the spirit of error. And attack it. Not with your own pontificating, not with your own intelligence, but fight it with the spirit of truth. That's why it's important to get into the word of God, to find what the spirit of truth is, because you're going to be able to see when the spirit of error is trying to be the spirit of truth, when that is actually the spirit of error. Try everything. The test is Jesus Christ. The more you know Jesus, the more you will know the spirit of truth. The more you know the spirit of truth, the easier it will be to find the spirit of error. Let's pray. Lord Heavenly Father, thank you for this day again. Thank you for allowing us to be able to look into the scriptures and be able to see the spirit of error and the spirit of truth. Help us to cling to the spirit of truth and refrain from that spirit of error. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you again for listening and watching our Sunday School. Can't wait to see all of you again. And I hope that this lesson was a blessing to you, as it was also to me. And I'm praying for you. I know pastors praying for you. I know, I know our church staff is praying for you. And we can't wait to see you soon. On Sunday, on another Sunday, on Wednesday. Just I, hopefully everything will be back to normal again soon. We miss you and we love you. And I just want to say thank you and have a great weekend.